My name is uh, Joe Rodriguez, and this is Jack Darren, and this is the uh, BMW 3.5 CSL that, that Jack and I built. I met this guy, somebody just sent him over, said I was, knew something about BMW CSLs, and he wanted to do something with a CSL, so how could I say no? This is Jack Darren, and uh, he's, you know, the, the guru of all racing, everything, hot rods, you name it. My racing history goes way back before BMWs. We were with IMSA, Red Lobster cars, uh, Can-Am cars, uh, my first racing was with Bob Holbert and Roger Penske back in the late 50s. So I've been turning wrenches for a long time. 1972, BMW decided they'd try to go after the production car and they ran these cars up until 75. And then when they ran out of uh, what to do in Europe, they won everything imaginable. What will we do with these extra cars and chassis we have left over? So they decided to put together four IMSA cars and come over and run the IMSA group. And that's how we got involved with an ex-Peter Gregg car. Peter took over the cars in 76 and I got involved in 77. And here we are a couple years later, still getting involved with the cars of that time period. When I was a kid, I lived in Montvale, New Jersey, and uh, I lived about a mile away from BMW of North America, so in the mid-70s, I'd get on my bike and I'd go, and, and I would tell them I was doing a school project, and they would load me up with books and literature and posters and press kits, and, you know, uh, they were fantastic. They, they spent the time with me, and it really left an impression on me because it, it was, a, there was a, a personal relationship there. Fast forward to the late 80s, early 90s, I got the idea of building a Group 5 CSL. But very specific, if BMW uh, took a Group 5 car and turned it into a street car, uh, fit and finish, it would be to a very high standard uh, and it would be well-mannered and yet you could take it to the track if you wanted to and race the pants off of it. So we got together at a very early time in the car's life and in his life and we started building this beautiful gem behind us. Basically a BMW CSL, CS, made into an L. He did most of the ordering. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, and if there's somebody to make it get done right, he's the man. That's our Joe Rodriguez. <laughs> years of watching cars and clubs, uh, I don't see the Ferraris and the Porsche people being that dedicated year after year after year. They get in it and they get out of it. But the, the BMW people seem to go back many, many years and love the cars. It's a love affair. Yeah, even now, 30 years goes by, 40 years goes by, and you can still see the same guys that are involved in yeah. these cars. Yeah and the passion is still very much alive. The CSL you know, group of people, is, it's, it's a pretty small group small and it's group. Yep. a tight-knit bunch of people. And uh, one of the guys that I knew, his name is Arthur Porter, uh, out in Colorado. Art's a good guy, he stayed at our house. He's been with BMW quite a while, he loves them. I was on the phone with, with Arthur and I said, 
I'm, I'm at this point I'm looking for someone who's going to help me with the car that's going to build the car with me and really know the chassis and really know all the workings of this car and how to how to set it up the right way and he goes oh there's Jack Darren he's the guy he goes if you can get Jack Darren to build this car he goes that's going to be some car I'll never forgive him <laughs> <laughs> You know, back then they didn't have terms like resto mod or, or tribute car. None of that, none of those words existed. I, I, I'm trying to explain to Jack what I want to build. And I said, well, I said, you know, it's not, not really, you know, full-blown race car. It's not a factory car, obviously. I said, it's kind of a German hot rod. That was the term that I used. And uh, I, I think it stuck. <laughs> This was before we even started to even build the car itself. I got into the parts business. So I would, back then, you know, 25 plus years ago, you could buy a, a parts car for 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks. So I'd keep all the holy grail stuff and then I'd sell things that I didn't need or things that weren't gonna go on the car. And that's how I started to fund the project. It took me about seven years just to compile parts. I would find parts cars in people's backyards and garages, buy them, drag them home, and just start parting them out. And you know, this is all pre-internet. So the, our, you know, the only source that we had really was like the, the Roundel the, the, from the, the BMW CCA and, or Hemmings Motor News, things like that. So, and that's how it started. You know, I would just advertise, sell parts, and keep all the good stuff. <laughs> well, in the, in the automotive game, it's basically what it is. There are a lot of BMW people that uh, you have to bow when you say BMW, and if it's not the original, and if you've changed anything on it, it's an insult to the designers, and well, that's, that's not what racing's about. It's an E9 chassis. It started its life out as a 3OCS coupe. Uh, all original Group 5 bodywork on it. When I got into it, there were guys that were getting out of it. Uh, it goes back to you know life changes, things like that. Guys were getting out of it, so I bought whatever they had or anything that I'd get my hands on. The fender flares were one of the first things that I bought. The rears actually came from Arthur, Arthur Porter. The fronts, uh, Marcus, I think Marcus Glarner out of, Glarner out of Canada. So, they, I mean, parts came from literally all over the world on the car. The only thing that I didn't have was the Group 5 rear wing. Jack knew um, Cunningham, Rug, Rug Cunningham, really well at that time. And at that time, Rug had the Group 5 car. So Jack had asked Rug if they could make a template of that side plate. So they sent Jack a, a, a template of it, and then Jack made the two side plates out of aluminum. Just a, th a three-quarter inch piece of plywood, cut to that perimeter, round off the edges, cut a piece of aluminum out, tie it down to the edge and just bend it over the shape and bend the other one over and run a bead down the middle. And they warped beautifully. <laughs> So we had to fill them up with foam and get them to be flat. Straighten them out. Yep, we had to straighten them out. And then, of course, build the mounting to the deck lid. And then we got a, a the, the, the center section. The wing section. itself came out of Tom Milner's shop. That, yep. Doing BMW stuff. That was PTG at the time. Yep. I chose the S38 engine because it was, uh, at that time, it was the latest and the greatest. Uh, it was, you know, early, you know, probably 93. Three, I guess somewhere in there and I said that's a that's a great engine to, to choose because it's still a straight six which is true to because the car originally had a, a straight six I mean at that time and you got to remember it was you know 20 some odd years ago every now and again like an m49 engine would come up it's like which is rare as hen's teeth but I, I wasn't building that 
you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, that really deserved to be in an original car somewhere. <laughs> so I chose the S38 because of its reliability, its power, things are readily available. Again, you know, it, 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 all, it all boiled down to all of those things. It's got a, a Woodward power steering rack and I don't think there's probably 10 CSLs in the world that have rack and pinion steering. No. Yeah, well, boxes. They're all box. Yeah. yeah. And that's something no one will ever see. Yeah. But he had to have it. Yeah. It did. There were a lot of conversion, a lot of things that we did. You know, we had we had toyed with the idea of using a steering box and things like that, and you know, it just kind of it kind of morphed into its own. It evolved. Own. It, yeah. it did. It really did. It, it the car really did evolve into its own creation, <laughs> literally. Well, that's the beauty of, uh, in my eyes, of trying to make a, a streetable car into a raceable car. There's a big difference in making a race car first that's streetable. So he wanted to have this as close as he could to being a raceable car, but with a contemporary motor and updated this so the reliability is there. He's not looking for seven or 800 horsepower. Just wants a good, reliable example of what racing was back in those days. And he did a damn good job. <laughs>
with race cars, I like to use the word accessibility because uh, BMW and March, uh, they built cars that want to go to half hour races. If you have a problem, you put it on the trailer and you take it home in your shop of 30 people, rebuild it for the next race. That doesn't work in endurance race. It's got to be worked on by three people immediately in the pits. So my, my accessibility of everything is one of my guiding roles. Uh, like I mentioned, you can take the engine, transmission, and rear er, headers out in one lump. You can't do that with a normal CSL. It's basically a unibodied car with a, a tube chassis in it. You know, the, the tubing comes through, ties into the shock towers in front and rear into the trunk. Uh, and then, of course, the transmission tunnel and it gets into, the, into where the dash mounts up. The uh, dashboard, two juice buttons fold out and you can work on instruments. The windshield comes out in a matter of what, maybe a minute? Somewhere Take there. the windshield out. Yep, four clips. Because it all has to happen in the pits, yep. rain or shine. I think that some cars that you work on, or some projects that you work on, it doesn't really matter what it is. They fight you and they fight you and they never stop fighting you until the end. And this car never did that. It and was your goal. It was, but we, you know, we he put never a lot gave of, up. But we put a lot of thought and there was a lot of time, a lot of research that, that we both did. That, that, you know, a lot of phone calls, a lot of time. At one point we called it the, the R&D CSL, remember? Rodriguez Darren CSL and the Research and Development CSL. Yeah. All I know is that one magazine article said it took me 19 years to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 17, well, you know, <laughs> 17, 19, you know. But it wasn't steady. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's all a matter of finding the parts. Yeah. You could spend a month making one part, but a month of time went by. Yeah. That's where I always got a kick at building a car at my category of level GM and at Ford, they'll spend months and years, life testing stuff, all kind of prototypes crashing in the walls and all that. They finally say we're gonna build this as a production car. It's on the market three months and it's getting recalled. <laughs> but these guys expect me to build a race car and come off the first time and go <laughs> break track records. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> about endurance racing, all those fenders will be on with Zeus buttons. So if you do bang one up, you can immediately change one. Uh, if he bangs one up, I don't want to hear the phone call. <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't want to get that phone call. Because before we painted it, I said, oh, now's the time to make mold. <laughs> Well, and not only that, but it took from, from rough body work to finish paint. It was about a year. You know, the colors, remember what we went through, just trying to get the colors right. And... A car like this, early 1970s, could be built again today and still be a good looking car. They have a good classic line to them. In today's world of vinyl stick on of everything, I've seen people walk up to a car like this and they'll run their hand over the colors and they're looking for the bounce of the vinyl. So, ooh, these are painted on. <laughs> You gotta remember, I mean, when I was 10, 12 years old, I mean, I was into this. So it, it followed me, you know, and fast forward to when I was in my late teens and early 20s, when I started to say, okay, this is the concept of what I wanna build, you know, and then following me through my 30s and 40s and now through my 50s, this car and I have been through a lot together. <laughs> it's, uh, it really has followed me throughout the bulk of my life. I had owned other cars when I was in my 20s, 
it always came back to it always came back to this car. You know, the reason that we're here today is to celebrate the 10th anniversary of uh, the completion of the car. Uh, it was finished October 10th of 2009. Uh, it took Jack and I 10 years to build the car and then seven years to compile all the parts together. So 17 years in total. Every time I drive it, I, uh, you know, I can listen to that thing and I can, every single sound that it's making, I know where it's coming from, what it's doing. Uh, every gauge I can, you know, I'm always watching, you know, gauges and paying attention to what everything's doing. And then for a brief moment, I drop all that and plant it and go. <laughs>